call to this last um, session of the day um, around the table of entitled Religious and Cultural Yesterday and Today? Question mark. Mm -hmm. um, and um, it's uh, um, it, it's um, a um, a true uh, honour and a privilege to introduce this extremely distinguished, um, extremely uh, uh, distinguished panel. Um, I shall give extremely brief introductions because otherwise we will be here for the whole two hours that remain. Um, the first speaker will be Rabbi Joseph Dweck, who is the senior rabbi of the Spanish and Portuguese Sephardi community of the UK. He will be followed by uh, Dr. Rowan Williams, who is Master of Magdalen College, Cambridge, among many other things in his past. Um, <laughs> um, he'll be followed by uh, Dr. Edward Kessler, the founding director of the Wolf Institute, and as children say in primary school, last but not least, <laughs> Professor Adrian Ubiagini of the History Faculty here in Cambridge and of Sydney Sussex College. Um, each of the speakers has been asked, if they haven't been asked, they're being asked now, to speak for five to, uh, to seven minutes. Um, then the discussion will be opened up to all of you, and then finally there'll be a period when each of our speakers has an opportunity to respond uh, to the discussion. So, uh, um, um, I'll wrap my way. Thank you. Um, I, I want to thank Ed and, uh, and the Wolf Institute. It's been an amazing day. I mean, what uh, unbelievable information and, and uh, ideas and sharing that we've been able to experience, especially for me being a senior rabbi of the of the Spanish and Portuguese Jews congregation, now as the Spartan community, which was this community that came into that came into the country in 1656. Um, and I can say, listen, you'll 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 browse the biographies. I'm the one without the select publications after my name. So I'm I'm sharing uh, I'm sharing perspectives from the community. Um, and these perspectives are not, you know, you come in in 2016 and you wonder, you know, what, is, what are these perspectives, how do they trickle down? There are very clear, very clear lines that one can draw if one is paying attention all the way back to the original days. And the nature and identity of this, of this community. We've been using the word tolerant, toleration, tolerance all day. Uh, questioning what it means, trying to understand what it is that it means within this context. And uh, as David pointed out, uh, to a degree, that toleration is not exactly the same as admiration. And so when the people are coming in, toleration is determined. But it's very clear, or it's understood, that admiration is not taken for granted. And so we come into this country, and we are allowed to worship freely, but it is to be very understated. It is to be quiet, to be reserved. And of course, as was indicated today, there was certainly concern that the Jews might convert those around them. And of course, there was concern among the Jews that conversion might happen. You know, I, when I first came in, I went through a tour through the city of London. As I was, I was, I was praying at Bevis Marks, I usually pray once a week at Bevis Marks. We have prayers every morning at Bevis Marks. We have the rabbi here, Rabbi Shalom Mars, who just hired as the new rabbi of Bevis Mars. Um, and I was going around with Mars B. who was the curator of the synagogue, and he was taking me for a tour uh, of the city, and we walked into Christchurch Spitalfield. And you don't walk in beyond the foyer, and there are plaques on the wall, they're open for everyone to see, of the Jews that were converted successfully. And so there are names on the wall that, 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 that present this. And, uh, and I suddenly thought, you know, about my predecessors and the circumstance that, that we found ourselves in during this time. Uh, and it wasn't just my predecessors, the, the hachamim of the congregation, but the leaders of the congregation. 
what were we to do to make sure that we would maintain this beautiful opening and allowance of worship in this new country, and at the same time make sure not to cause too many waves. So to show that we are investing completely in society, supporting the country, thankfully, uh, for allowing us to be able to enter, and yet at the same time making sure that there was never any indication that we were interested in asserting ourselves beyond what was accepted. And so you have the ma'amad, you know, the ma'amad is the governing body of the community, of the congregation, and they had a great deal of power over the congregation. Uh, they were able to exact fines on the congregation. They actually uh, arbitrate, they, they sat for arbitration whenever there were conflicts. Uh, business conflicts, uh, social conflicts within the congregation. Uh, and if you chose, you were elected to sit on the mamad and refused, you were also fined for not sitting on the mamad. But there was, this, there was this tremendous concern that the congregation shouldn't act out of line. And so, you know, it's, 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 there was very much concern that everybody should behave. And so I, I find it ironic that, you know, I mean, God has a sense of that, that the one thing that Peeps walks in to see is the Sukhat Torah celebration. You know, this is anybody who knows. This is the, the you know, the less civilized, one of the less civilized. I, I'll say that after that, in the Spanish and Portuguese congregation, it, is, it, it had reverted to be the most understated and stately <laughs> procession of any Sukhat Torah on the face of the globe. And I walked in, and it's still till today, I mean, I, I shook things up a bit last year, you know, and, and how it is that we did it. And I, I claimed that I was bringing it back to the original custom, the original <laughs> where they were actually dancing and celebrating and so on. But I mean, a stately procession of Sefer Torah around the Sheba, <coughs> not to cause too much rise. Um, and so you, you, you see very strongly in the culture of the Spanish and Portuguese congregation, a tremendous sense of decorum, reserve, stateliness, if you will, in these services. And uh, it's unique in all the world. It's unique in all the world in the manner and the, the, the strength that it's, that it's put forward. And so this certainly comes from the sense of needing to make sure that we do not stand out too much, that we do not threaten the environment in which we are, we are thankfully able to, to worship and serve. And, uh, and at the same time, the hachamim had to deal with, with these concerns. So, you know, we uh, saw uh, an old <coughs> soup kitchen build, building that was used as a soup kitchen. So it still has the, you know, a sign on one door in, a sign on the other door out. And there was this procession in the city. And this was also an issue for that, I mean, because it was established by the church, and the soup kitchen was there, of course, to feed the poor and provide soup and bread. And, of course, there was conversions that happened during this time. Because if you're providing soup and bread, then of course, you know, you have this opening. And so the kahal and the rabbi said the thing, we better open a soup kitchen. I mean, what, what are we to do in the, face of these, in the face of these issues? And there were more complex issues that one had to be concerned about. My predecessor, Hacham David Nieto, uh, the first rabbi of Bevis Marks in 1701, he was dealing with a question as to, I mean, we, we spoke today about how we share this reading of the Bible, the Christians and Jews. So we share this tradition, this, this heritage of being able to see the Bible in an authoritative text. But what about the oral tradition that is part, very much part of the, the Jewish reading and the, the understanding of the text, the interpretation of the text? This was challenged by, by the, the Jews in Yeto's congregation. He had to write Mateda in order to be able to strengthen and to support the tradition of the Jewish people that had this reading, this oral tradition of how it is that we actually do read the biblical text. Or even before him, Hacham Sasportas, who was the first Hacham of the congregation. Two years he was here only, but he was dealing with these questions of Messiah. Who is the Messiah? How do we relate to messianic uh, desire and, and even uh, uh, love towards the idea? I mean, after we'd gone through so many difficulties, after we were running out of the fires of Portugal and Spain, there was tremendous desire to be able to find some level of salvation, how it is that we will find our redemption. And so he had to deal with the problems of Shabtai Tzvi and the questions of what it is that we do as Jews with, with these issues. And so these were very complex issues um, that both the Mama, the governing body, and the rabbis had to deal with. And if we look at it in terms of how it is that it played out today, I mean, the Isfaradim are very reserved. 
in this country. Yeah, I mean, I think that in general there's reserve in the country, but the Sfaradim are ultra reserved, yeah, in terms of the tradition, in terms of how it is that we engage. And so many Ashkenazim will say to me, oh, the Sfaradim, they keep within themselves, yes, they, they hold to their own community, which is not necessarily true, but there's definitely this perception in where uh, up until today we have nursed through the generations that we contribute faithfully to society, that we uphold the great strengths of the country and everything that we can do, but we do it quietly and we do it with a low tone. Now, the, the, one of the challenges, and with this I'll end, you know, one of the challenges is, is, is that the best tack nowadays in all situations? And is it not necessary sometimes to be able to stand up and to be able to, to say with a strong but, but uh, eloquent strength yeah, what it is that is important for our community, for our people, in order to be able to maintain continuity in the future? And so those questions come to the fore um, these days. Um, but it is an exciting time. I look forward to it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's a great delight to be asked to uh, share in this discussion. And I'm very sorry I've not been able to be here for more of the day. But I want to begin by noting a fact about the words tolerance and intolerance. They both have the same subject. It's us doing something to them. I tolerate, or otherwise, somebody else. And that's why I'm never quite sure that tolerance as an ideal, a social ideal, is such a very good thing, because it leaves in place an unchallenged sense of who actually determines the rules. And when asked about whether I'm in favour of tolerance, I'm just occasionally tempted to say, well, actually, no, I'm not. <laughs> and um, then have to explain why that doesn't mean I want to reinstate the Spanish position. <laughs> but I begin with that, because if you start with a model of tolerance, and I think we've already heard this in a sense, then those who are the object of being tolerated are put in a very odd position. They are told that they're allowed to be there. The subliminal message is given that they're allowed to be there if they don't make themselves too awkward. They're told that they are generously being given a share in public life, so long as they always remember that they are generously being given a share in public life. <laughs> and all of these things, I think, complicate what tolerance means. And pluralism seems to me and I'm looking at the, the two words, the two key words of this guy, tolerance and pluralism. Pluralism, it seems to me, ought to imply precisely everybody's guaranteed and equal right to make the same kind of noise. Um, not only is it that <laughs> but to make the same kind of noise socially. That's to say, to expect that there will be a public argument in which they have a role that is assured. My own hope, model, ideal for a pluralist society is what I've often in the past called argumentative pluralism. That is not pluralism in which every community lives in its silo, and not pluralism where there is an unspoken assumption that somebody is doing the tolerating, but an atmosphere in which it is possible for very distinctive and very seriously and deeply rooted convictions to be brought out in the public arena. <clears throat> and of course for this you need a very particular kind of moderation from government. We talk about moderated discussions, don't we? And I'm much more interested in the word moderated than the word moderate because I think a good moderation of public discussion is part of what good government does in a properly democratic society. Not instantly saying you have to be moderate in your views or your behaviour to be allowed into the discussion, but to know that within the process of society there will be a legal authority that moderates, that holds the ring, that restrains violence, and imbalance. And well, Ed heard me say something like this in uh, 
Doha a few days ago. Uh, to a not wholly sympathetic um, Qatari Muslim <laughs> audience about what a secular and pluralist society does like look like. Um, I'm not holding my breath to hear from the government of Qatar that they've been persuaded by this. <laughs> but it's worth talking about, even there. It's worth, I think, asking the question of how in a de facto plural world, religiously and ethically plural, you construct and maintain legal institutions and legal conventions that are robust enough to hold good, honest public conversation without pressure. I like to think that we haven't entirely lost that ideal in this country. Um, I worry occasionally that both populist pressures and administrative paranoia push us away from it. But I think it's still worth arguing in favor of. I suppose coming to this particular occasion, this particular set of questions, I don't have very much from my um, academic experience to bring to bear except for two uh, kinds of perspective which have been in my mind listening to bits of discussion this afternoon. I wrote a book years ago on St. Teresa of Avila. Of course, one of the most interesting things about Teresa of Avila is her Jewish background and the way in which she had to negotiate a society in which you had the choice of converting and being the object of profound ecclesiastical suspicion, or not converting and being the object of profound ecclesiastical suspicion. <laughs> uh, Teresa's family had gone for the first option, and she must have known the family history, because it was dramatic enough with her grandfather being hauled up before the Inquisition in 1485, and her father having to argue in the law courts of Avila for his patent of nobility against objections of uh, unfriendly neighbours who knew something about the family's background. Teresa, within her Christian framework, still has to negotiate this question of how quiet or how audible am I allowed to be. She's a woman, she's a Jew, she's a contemplative. And it's rather a, an explosive mixture in 16th century Spain, and she knows it. And I was fascinated by how her awareness of her social situation moves into and shapes some of what she says about her spiritual experience and her reforms of a religious order. So that was one perspective which was in my mind this afternoon, not least in connection with Teresa's furious and persistent refusal to apply within the Carmelite order the statutes of purity of blood that were being applied throughout the rest of the religious and Christian world in Spain at the time, and how her best friend and secretary continued that resistance after her death in the Spanish-controlled territories of the Low Countries, and how it all failed. That's one little sideline on it, which made me think a bit, when I was doing the work for that, about the paradoxes of tolerance, and what uh, a certain political generation is called repressive tolerance. The other perspective is an observation made by a 20th century Catholic writer, who said, if you look at the early Middle Ages, one thing that comes through in people's attitudes to Jewish communities is that the more the dominant society thinks of itself in terms of the imagery of Hebrew scripture, <coughs> anointed monarchs and chosen peoples, the more anti-Semitic society is. As if you're competing for the same space. Only one set of people can be the chosen people. Only one authority can work. Now, I don't know how true that is from the historian's point of view, but it strikes me as having resonance in a number of settings other than just early medieval Europe, not least, of course, Russia. And the complex and many, many sided and alarming phenomenon that is Russian anti Semitism has something to do with that sense again of anointed authority and national chosenness. As if Christian communities are constantly drawn towards a model which, in fact, 
they have theologically moved away from. And so one of the issues that intrigues me is when Jews and Christians argue historically and at present, are they actually arguing about one thing? No, manifestly, I think. But there's a lot of our history and our culture and our mythology which somehow makes us competitors for space. And one of the effects of late 20th century theology, the Catholic Church's Nostra Aetate document and other things, has been, I think, to move us just a bit away from that sense that we can only relate as competitors. But that takes me back finally to the point about pluralism. Pluralism is not, I think, a value in itself. It's simply a fact of our human coexistence. The value stuff, the ethical stuff, comes in with the question, the big question, of how we actually manage the givenness of religious diversity. For that, I've argued occasionally, we need a properly intelligent secular political framework to hold the ring, which doesn't mean the silencing of religious voices, but quite the contrary, the allowing of honest religious exchange. I don't yet think that's impossible, but I do think we have to be fairly clear and fairly intentional about both the equality that presumes among communities of different convictions and the visibility or audibility of religious perspectives in the public sphere. So that I'm not looking to a secularism that silences religious voices in public, nor to some kind of covert confessional state. Not an easy place to inhabit, but I think it can be done. And I hope discussions like this will help us see how it can be done. Well, when um, Rowan talked about argumentative pluralism as a Jew, it makes me feel very much at home, um, <laughs> since argument is so much part of, uh, of Jewish existence. Um, I, I'd like to touch on um, five features of what I think, uh, not what I think, but what the Commission's work and my own work identify. It clearly changed by the later 13th century in the fine balance of religious sentiment, civic competition, and world finance in England and in Europe too. The Franciscan scholar educated in Oxford and Paris, John Peckham, Archbishop of Canterbury, actively promoted some of the thinking that had developed in canon law over the last decades, as we're talking about the 1280s here already, the discourse against Jews and Israel. Ambitious kings like Edward I and like Philip IV in France, in different ways across the water, realized the power of the church to generate predictable taxes throughout their realms. They also accepted that the moral leadership of figures like John Peckham was constituted now of public right. The niche of royal service and thus of public utility inhabited by the Jews in the first 200 years, as we've seen, of their life in England was no longer so evident. They were associated more readily with danger and ill intent, and the fruit of their labors was vilified, even as it was placed in the hands of other groups. A much broader tax base and Jew free kingdom followed the expulsion of 1290. The Jews left England in the summer of 1290, but memories of them persisted. As Anthony Bale has shown so well, Jews remained part of devotional life, Christian devotional life, and better as they were in thinking about the crucifixion and also in marrying piety. They formed part of the world of miracle and affect, and of course, Something remained in the converts left behind. But that perhaps is for another day. Thank you. Just to explain this, is of course, one of the Canterbury tales. This invocation after the Jewish IRS tells the story of child murder at the head of Jews. Uh, that's her contribution to the amusement of the pilgrims. She just ends it by all of a sudden turning to uh, crowd and invoking the memory of Hugh Lincoln as it were another child killed by Jews. And this is interesting because this is 13 sort of 90s. So it's as if you know you can just assume that people know these type of uh, what are Marian stories that and, and within which are embedded stories about uh, Jewish cruelty. And hence 
picture it and expect that his readership will know what he's referring to. Thank you very much. And how they have been touched on by the, the lectures and conversations that we, we, we had earlier. Um, when, when John Morrow was speaking, um, this change that was taking place um, uh, under Cromwell and facilitated and encouraged by Cromwell uh, is, is, is mirrored very much by the changes that we have going on today in the landscape of this country. Um, the change being of three types. First, this is a country that's less Christian than it ever was. And that the shape and the face of Christianity has changed dramatically in just two generations. Uh, in terms of the diversity within Christianity, um, the evangelical and Pentecostal churches, and think about in particular, as well as the Orthodox churches. Um, so that's the first feature of contemporary British society. The second, of course, is that we're much more diverse. That uh, rather than one in 150, as I mentioned earlier, it's one in ten identify with one of the minority religions, Islam, uh, Hinduism, Sikhism, and then fourthly, Judaism, of the non-Christian religions. So we have great diversity, greater than we've ever had. And the third is the dramatic growth of those who do not, uh, are not affiliated with any religion, the nons, if you like, or the millennials. Now all of those three factors are what we have, that is our society today, so how do we create this vibrant, this tolerant, this pluralist, how do we live in that society? And there are five features which I think echo with what we heard earlier. And, and the first is that we all need to feel part of an ongoing national story, all of us. And how are we part of that story? Well, to a certain extent, the case study of anglo Jury is a model of that sense of being part of this story. Rabbi Dweck talks about this inheritance that he was aware of when he arrived without his British accent 18 months ago, but part of this national British narrative. And David, in his talk, that point about being torn in one's identity, between identities, is one of the challenges of being part of this diverse society. Do we hold it together in the way that David mentioned? Or is it something that's going to break us asunder? The second feature of our modern society, at least what we should be working towards, it seems to me, is a sense of being treated equally. All of us. Men and women of faith or of no faith. And I was struck by David's comment, David Feldman's comment in his address, that toleration does not necessarily equal equality. Maybe there's something that Rome is alluding to. You tolerate somebody else, but you may not think of that person as equal to you. So there is some way to go from tolerating somebody to actually seeing them as equal to oneself. But being treated equally is what something we expect from our society. Equal in the face of the law, for example. The third feature is that as uh, in terms of culture, in terms of religion, that we are valued by the society in which we inhabit. John talked about the unabrogated covenant, John Coffey, in terms of some of the um, evangelical theologies of Judaism. And actually the term unabrogated or irrevocable covenant lies at the heart of the renewed Christian understanding of Judaism, whether it be Roman Catholic or a variety of Protestant churches. That sense of valuing a partnership, valuing um, another, the common biblical heritage that Cromwell seemed to be alluding to, is another sign. But the point about overstaying one's welcome, whether we are, we are we're no longer guests in a society, maybe it's certainly not applicable to Jews, but sometimes my Muslim and Hindu friends talk uh, they're, they're second or third generation. They're no longer guests. They're no longer hosted. They are as British as we are. So being valued uh, equally seems to me terribly important. The fourth is this freedom to practice our beliefs. Being free to practice belief as we see fit. As Jews, as Christians, as Muslims, as men and women of any faith community. And finally, and perhaps, perhaps most significantly, is that we feel empowered 
to shape our society as we would wish it to be shaped. It's not just about reducing and eliminating disability, but it's about being empowered to make that contribution to move our society to the next stage. And that, it seems to me, is what pluralism is about. That in a pluralist society, it's not just about removing those disabilities so that Jews and Catholics can become members of parliament in the mid-19th century. But it's about being empowered that we can make those changes to our society that we feel need to be made, that we feel challenged to make those changes. So that the soup kitchen that the SP congregation sets up is not just that we can fit into society, but we are contributing and we're changing the society in which you're living at that particular moment. And so it is of all of us. So those are sort of the five features, if you like, that um, one could identify in a, for a vibrant and a tolerant and an equal society. And which I think we've heard allusions to throughout, throughout the day. Perhaps we'll come back to that. Thank you. <clears throat> well, I should start by saying um, that there is um, a member of this panel, unfortunately, was not able to attend due to a clash of the debate in the House of Lords. And this is Maura O'Neill. And, and, and it's a real pity that she's not here. But fortunately, she circulated a paper which is together with your PAC. And I would like to start my remarks by going back to some of the issues which she was planning to raise. And the starting point was how toleration has changed uh, over the past 360 years. In, in a way, uh, you agree with what has been said, certainly I do agree with what has been said by the other members of this round table, uh, particularly with reference to pluralism, with reference to equality, and with the our relationship, which is inbuilt in the notion of toleration. Now, one of the points Honor O'Neill was going to make, and she makes in this paper, is actually that there is an interesting change in the value and significance of toleration between the 17th and 18th century champions of toleration and the present day. There has been a sort of degrading of the notion of toleration uh, since then. For many of the early protagonists of the debate on, on toleration, toleration was a, a difficult and a demanding virtue. It has to be exercised because the starting point of uh, the debate in those days was that there was no uh, assumed, no taken for granted right to say uh, everything one feels or thinks, nor was there a duty on the side of the majority to tolerate what was being said. So toleration was not the obvious uh, fallback natural response people had to diversity or to difference, but it was, it was perceived to be as a, as a virtue, a demanding virtue, which was about <coughs> engaging with diversity, coming to terms with things you or behavior or people you strongly disagree with or disapprove of, and in the process, of course, we built uh, toleration, which was based on a, on a virtue called tolerance. So tolerance led to a power relationship called tolerance, a virtue, led to a power relationship called toleration. This is also something which David Feldman discussed in his, his paper earlier on. What has changed since then, as O'Neill says, uh, amounts to the, the loss of this notion of an established truth, or an established religion, if you like. Truth has been relativized, freedom, freedom of expression becomes the default position because there is no longer anything uh, which you, uh, any high platform from which you feel you can tolerate people who are obviously inferior or wrong, but anything and everything seems to be entitled to, 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 to respect, which is good in itself, but comes with a, an impoverishment, with a weakening of our uh, of our uh, sort of ability to relate to the world outside us. And this takes us to the second point I want to make, and that is not in the O'Neill paper, which you find in your pack, the significance of secularization. Secularization has come with many advantages, um, but also with a major problem, or a major form of 
a weakening of our moral sense, if that is the word. Because it has narrowed out our cultural field of vision, generating a sort of quasi-religious assumptions, taking things we take for granted, unquestioned certainties now based on the certainty of relativism. Because we dismiss the very idea that there is a superior position from which you can tolerate people you disagree with, you create by default a sort of new orthodoxy, which is based on relativism, and then narrows our cultural field of vision. Now, there are whatever the merits of this particular development, there are a number of alarming drawbacks. Because it may lead us to accept in an unquestioning way, a secular worldview and all the related assumptions which come with it. For example, assumptions about what is rational and what is irrational in terms of human behavior. To many of us, uh, now secularism and uh, behaving as if only the material world is rational is become a sort of self-evident set of uh, principles which in itself, or in themselves, can lead to a form of lack of toleration. And this lack of toleration is evident in two different ways. The lack of toleration of relativism. In the first instance, which is the most alarming um, way in political terms, it prevents us uh, to understand, it prevents us from understanding most of the world in which we live. Most of the world outside Western Europe and North America is not secularized. And when we deal with it, we cannot simply say everything is equal because in effect our tolerance does not stretch that far. Come across antiquated, perhaps fundamentalist visions and assumptions about religion or possible things which challenge us in a way that of course creates a political backlash. And I think this is, this is lack of tolerance. This lack of tolerance comes from, our, from the narrowing of our, as I said, field of cultural sensitivity. But there is another problem which is associated with it. It prevents us from engaging with our own history, not as historians, but generally speaking, society. Because we must bear in mind that the culture in which we live in Western Europe and North America, which is democratic, it is defined by feminism, defined by equal rights across race divides, about, uh, across gender divides, across sexual inclination and sexual behavior and so on and so forth. This is a highly, a very modern, a very recent development. Most of the past which we had to reckon with in order to understand where we come from was not democratic, it was marked by beliefs in the divine rights of monarchs, for example beliefs in social deference, which were taken for granted. Uh, it was a world in which slavery, racism, homophobia, and many other attitudes which we rightly and profoundly disapprove of, were nevertheless part of the ordinary worldview, even of comparatively enlightened people. So here there are two problems which are reciprocally related. On the one hand, the narrowing of our field of moral sensitivity, on the other hand, our sort of uh, inability to relate to our past or to understand our past, if not in a judgmental way. All these issues were raised already some 11 years ago by a colleague of ours, himself originally from Cambridge, David Canadine, in an essay about uh, what is history now and the challenge that historians uh, had to face when trying to interpret the present, the, the past of the, the present. But there is a way in which this challenge affects also the way we relate, for example, with the phenomenon of militant uh, Islam or the phenomenon of uh, religious-inspired terrorism. We should try to explain to ourselves why these forms of culture, which we disapprove of so much, are able to attract recruits and attract support in the West. Why? And that is when, that is when the sort of Tolerance, which 17th century advocates of tolerance had to develop, is still required, coming to terms with what is apparently unacceptable, what is profoundly revolting. 
There are some things which historians can do on their own, and some things which we could not do. Historians, as I said already, are like ambassadors. They represent the old world, they interpret the past to the present. In this function, they must be, and they must act as peacemakers. They do so when they refuse to become the apologists of the past. There are people in the historical profession who would like, for example, to celebrate or commemorate in a celebratory way our imperial traditions. <coughs> or in other countries to celebrate the national revolutions. Well, both attitudes are profoundly misleading and, and tendentially dangerous. Historians have instead a duty to contextualize the past. And in this way, they contextualize and they relativize the present, including our liberal values. Not because we are less committed to these liberal values, but because we need to relate between, between we need to find a way to relate these liberal values to a past and a side world within which uh, uh, liberalism was the exception rather than the rule, and in many cases was a heresy. This is something which historians can do, be ambassadors or mediators between the past and the present, between the world outside our society and the world within which we live and to which we are committed. There is something else which historians cannot do, and that is because we don't have either the moral authority or the competence, and that is to become, as, become the intermediaries between communities and confessions. And this is a task which requires teamwork, not just historians, but theologians, uh, community leaders, sociologists, policy makers, the sort of things the Wolf Institute has been doing, or indeed, indeed the sort of things which history and policy are in Cambridge in the Faculty, in the faculty of History try to achieve, understand the world, explain to politicians, engage with communities. In the report which um, Ed and others have made reference already, Living with Difference, Community, Diversity, and the common good is report, which is available, I think, also electronically for those who are interested. There are all sorts of very important points made about discussing and dealing with differences in the common ground. But one of the points which emerges quite clearly is that these differences are not just between people of different religious backgrounds, but increasingly, and more and more dramatically, between people of no religious conviction and various religious groups. And there is a tendency, which, uh, which is interesting from a historian's point of view, but it's also politically very dangerous, for people of non-religious group, of non-religious persuasion, to become more and more intolerant in the sense of being unable to understand the reasons and the extent to which people are perfectly rational, uh, perfectly modern in all possible ways, can be nevertheless deeply committed to a worldview which is inspired by traditional religious values. So this is a challenge for all of us. Well, uh, thank you for the exchange for that challenge. And, uh, thank you to all of you. We now have plenty of time to um, open up a wider discussion. Um, so I invite you to throw your hand in the air. I'll either ask a question or make a comment. John. Implicit in a lot of things being said is, um, um, is the need for robust promotion of a right to, um, to speak and perhaps you know, to make sure that that is, that, is um, that, that, the, that, that right itself is robustly policed. The problem we have, I suppose, is, is um, how, how tolerant we should be of intolerance. Um, that's one important question. But behind that is something that I'm very worried about at the moment, which is um, a real challenge to our ability both to respect one another and at the same time to maintain truth statements that we do have, uh, we do have a greater degree of wisdom than others. So I want to speak as someone who's a chairman of the school government for 10 years. I mean, as I said this morning, um, uh, when asked about Israel, is a surprise, it looks like um, an Amsterdam burger, but actually it was a rabbi. Um, I may look like a scruffy Cambridge academic, but I'm actually in holy orders. 
So I also want, as it were, to be able to make truth statements about my faith. When I was chairman of governors, we began, and it must be much worse now, to have this thing where you have to present all religion as equally true and equally valid. Rather than saying, um, we have a greatness of truth in the Catholic faith, but we have respect um, the truth of, of other people. Now, for me, a really important document is the Vatican II document on ecumenism, um, because that says, in essence, we have a fullness of truth, but we share most of our truth with other people of faith. Now, it's talking explicitly about other Christian communities. But it goes on to say pretty clearly that other Christian communities live out their part of the truth much more fully than we do our wholeness of truth. Now, that, for me, can extend particularly to the whole Abrahamic faiths. But actually, even more than that, you can say to one another, you have things to teach us. But I need to feel that at the same time, we can still say, uh, if we're a faith school, that we have a fullness of faith which we want to share and celebrate with you, while at the same time respecting and giving a very positive account of alternative views. But there has to be still that sense, in my view, that you have to be able to say that you know, we do have a fullness of truth we wish to pass on to the next generation. But that is seen by some others. Now, if you go to the really hard questions, the really hard questions is what you do in the area of various areas of moral truth. So, specifically, let's come down to it, uh, uh, over, uh, over sexuality, where the capitalism has developed which Catholic teaching which is completely at odds with secular understandings. And therefore, that's a real stress point. And that's where each side can accuse the other of being intolerant in their tolerance. So, but I do want to insist that for me, the, the, there is a proper way forward where equality doesn't involve equality of the values of the different parts of an optical system, but equality of respect. And, respect, and so as a historian who spends my whole life trying to enter the mental worlds of people in the past, I spend a lot of my time as a Catholic clergyman trying to understand the mental worlds of people who are not in my mental world. I mean, for its work, I'm going to elaborate it now, but I'm to hear it often. The most profound spiritual experience I ever had was in, a, was in a Buddhist monastery. And I had to experience the fact that my God was present there. I can only understand it the way I can understand it, but still, that's another, that's another matter. So, I mean, when I was, I was invited to be part of a training program for um, people who, who volunteered, volunteers in hospice, and they wanted to have a group of experts to talk about how, how we can support people dying. So there was a Buddhist, um, a Muslim, myself, um, an evangelical Protestant, and a humanist. And the humanist said to me, uh, after we'd given our account, all admirable accounts of how we support the dying, and have those conversations with the dying which are helpful to them. Um, the humanist said, is there, any, is there any room for doubt in your faith? And I said, there's as much room for doubt in my faith as there's room for doubt in your doubt. Because, and I, he of course thought he was rational and we were irrational. And that's a form of intolerance. But because, so the problem of having secular authorities regulating, you know, the, this, this promotion of freedom is that if they start from that, that you know, everybody, everyone of faith is part of an irrational set of principles, we are rational ones, then you drain out the idea that each can promote their own understanding. Um, and at the same time, have real respect for other people. It's a very complicated area. So, sorry, that's more of a testimony than anything else. But I think it contributes, I think it grows out of what, what you all were saying. I hope I heard anyway. I think we'll take some questions. We'll take some Hi, I had a question for Ed. Um, you were talking about that people sometimes struggle with having a multiplicity of identities and, and learning how to reconcile those. And in my research, I've uncovered largely that um, when somebody comes to feel too strongly in one identity that often can lead to radical behavior or lifestyles. So creating or trying to foster a multiplicity of identities is actually in their favor. 
Um, so I wonder, how do you find the balance there between the struggle of having that, of having too many identities, and of having too few? Thank you. Anyone else like to, to contribute before? Yes. Yes, perhaps uh, uh, it's slightly related to the first comment. Uh, I'd like to touch on what uh, Eugenia said uh, about secularization, which, uh, which uh, is more working and uh, inevitably to uh, to rise of relativism. And perhaps to, uh, which is related to, to what Dr. Williams uh, said, the vision of um, uh, of secular political framework which allows for this religious uh, pluralism. Uh, but it, se it seems to me when we move uh, from the modern model of toleration, where this uh, established truth is accepted, but other views are tolerated, as perhaps when the Jews are admitted, uh, to, the, uh, to the model of uh, uh, religious pluralism, we in in inevitably um, uh, introduce relativism. Uh, uh, it's impossible to, uh, uh, to. It's impossible to be to build this uh, dualistic society without accepting that relativism is the model. That's all. Thank you. Sorry. I think there is a knot in some ways in, in the relationship between toleration and religious freedom and freedom of conscience and mostly in, in the relationship between communities and individuals because we have talked a lot about communities while actually the path yes. as I see it, Indian modern era is very much in the 17th century to radicals and the and so on the reflection about religious freedom and freedom of conscience of individuals and so there is this progressive distinction and, and, and differentiation by a state that grant toleration to single communities and the reflection on the right of an individual freedom of conscience. So my question is, uh, I have the perception coming from the continent that uh, in some ways this is a, a, a very British debate, which of course takes into account a lot of the communities. Of course there are other models just on the other side of the channel, which are clearly not Winning models, as we have seen as well, the nice city, the separation between the state and churches, and so on. Uh, I think we have two tensions that are both unresolved. Both the continental model wasn't exactly successful, but it seems to me also the other one has problems. Is there a way that the two models can discuss and integrate? Is in which you take an account in which institutions are clearly separated from any kind of church or ecclesiastical or religious influence? But in the meantime, you keep the voices of communities and live individuals in the public sphere. I think that if we can't in, put to, to both the elements, the, the separation between public institutions and individual communities, and on the other time, the right of communities to speak, and of individuals to speak, there is a problem. Well, I think yes, yeah, it's a question for the whole panel, really. Um, what do you think um, the role of taking offence has to play in this debate, and whether we have a certain um, onus to take offence or not in a certain way? Um, and there's a lot of talk, there have been a few articles recently about how um, the younger generation is, is too quick to take offence and, and wants to not be offended. Um, I also, I'm Quaker, and I um, think that there's a huge culture within Quakerism of um, not wanting to offend other people to the extent that often things that need to be said are not said. Um, I just, I suppose, I'm just interested in your thoughts on the role of that within the whole thing. Yes, I just wanted very much to follow from you. I, I think I've got you right. I, I'm very perturbed simply by the whole issue of safe space. And that the idea that uh, in our universities we're expected to have a most trench in our debates and to form the state of people's lives. The whole role of what academics actually play, but I'm just talking even the sphere among the students themselves, mm -hmm. is getting into the habit of not being able, of, of, of expecting or protesting when you are offended in are there degrees of offense, are there types of offense. Are there the sort of you know words and stones and sticks and whatnot? 
I mean, it just seems to me that, I, I don't know if that's what you were partly getting yes. at, and I observe it because I have a son who's, who's in his third year at Oxford now, and he's really, you know, you know, very much aware of this happening, and it actually relates to uh, to what your Jane was saying in terms of judging the past, because then it also relates to issues like, do I have the right to go down the street and not see it? Uh, a statue of Edward I to pick up the Jews, and of course, uh, just like those who don't want to see um, um, you know, Cecil uh, Rhodes in front of Oriel. So I'd really be interested in the opinions, and I'm happy to join your question in a way to the panel. Thank you. I think we've got an awful lot for our pastors. Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, I look around, maybe I'm the only Chinese uh, black hair here. And I have thought about that my mother black hair agent, uh, she is from Japanese, so I'm uh, very pleasure to attend this meeting. And uh, in this meeting, there are two key words. Uh, uh, one is tolerant, the other is pluralist. Uh, uh, just now, the uh, uh, pluralist is accepted by many of us, but the uh, tolerant is a discussing uh, word. Uh, but in my opinion, I think we need, we need tolerance. We need tolerance uh, because ideal uh, in our ideal perspective, uh, we uh, need to uh, advocate equal. We are all equal in ideal perspective, but in the actual uh, by in the actual situation, uh, everyone are not equal. Person to person is different. Nation to nations is different. Even religions, even religion are different. Because they are different, so uh, some person is stronger, some nation is stronger, some religious, some religion is stronger. In this background, in this actual background, we are not equal. So I think uh, 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 based on this actual background, uh, we are not equal, so we need to tolerate uh, from the stronger need to tolerate to the weaker or, uh, or the vulnerable. Uh, so it is just my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. And now might be a time to ask um, our speakers to respond and then we can take another round of comments and questions. But before I, I ask them to respond, I, I just want to add one thing, which I think in a, in a way it picks up on what John and Eugenio were saying, which was, uh, as I understood it, was to express um, the concern um, of people speaking from a uh, strong religious belief of uh, the danger of um, intolerance um, coming from a, a largely secular society which dismisses their belief as um, irrational. And that, of course, is one sort of intolerance. Um, and, and I understand the, um, the sort of sense of frustration um, which that sort of scornfulness uh, 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 produces. But it seems to me that the question of, uh, of what we tolerate and don't tolerate is, is not confined to that. And the sort of cutting edge of a lot of the issues which, which trouble us concerns not only other people's attitudes, but what sorts of practices by other people um, are, are to be 
allowed or condoned um, uh, from inside of other, uh, from inside of um, uh, other faith co uh, communities or other religious practices. So you know that's why there's controversy over the veil. That's why there's controversy over female circumcision. That's why there's some controversy over male circumcision. So, it, 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 so the issue of toleration is not only attitudinal, but it's also about practice. And the practices which create controversy are those which actually rub up against notions about rights and, free, and, and the rights of individuals and notions of unconsent. Anyway, with that um, additional point, perhaps we can uh, throw it back to the panel in the order in which we spoke originally. I don't think you have to speak to all, uh, each no, and every one of them. Each and every one of them. Um, you know, it seems to me that uh, especially coming from fi finding myself in the religious arena and representing that whether I like it or not, pretty much anywhere that I am. There, there, is, there is a very major issue with fundamentalist thought in religion. I, I do think that it's important to, to highlight that. You know, because we can talk about tolerance, and we can talk about um, recognizing the shades of difference that are inherent in the nature of humanity and the nature of the world. One of the issues that comes up when we are bogged down, for lack of a better term, by fundamentalist vision. And I don't think that that's something that is unique to religion. It manifests very presently in religion, but it's not something that's unique to religion. It's an evolutionary drive. If I do not open myself to, well, I'll say the other way, if I open myself to nuance, to subtlety, to doubt, and, and, and the possibilities that I might be incorrect, I'm vulnerable. And I would prefer to be protected rather than vulnerable. And it doesn't matter how it is that I manifest those feelings, right? And when I have God on my side, I always have much stronger you know, support in order to be able to do that. And that, to me, from a religious perspective, is the most frightening element um, that, I, that I experience in society because the doors to, to dialogue, which are essential to humanity, to be able to work out those nuances, to work out those subtleties, to be able to play out in front of each other what are the issues and where we find ourselves the same, alike, truths that we share, and where are the gaps, and how do we feel about those. We don't even have an open dialogue. We can't open the door to dialogue in fundamentalist mindsets. And where I'm looking at things in terms of black and white, and where my opinion is the opinion, and um, you'll either you'll either see it or or be damned, essentially. Uh, so so that I think is is something that's very important to, to bring out in terms of our consciousness and to question with regards to our dialogue and to what degree. And it's in all religions. It's not it's not confined there. Something that everyone deals with. Uh, and we have to we have to address in terms of how it is that we relate to that, and and how we address it. Because even though the doors are closed, somehow we have to be able to address those doors. We have to address the presence of them. The other side of that is, is that when, when when we experience that level of blockage in terms of being able to actually relate to reality, no matter the level of nuance and subtlety, is to cling to reason. And that reason will be the, the aspect that I hold, whether reason works to define or to, to, uh, to uh, interpret every level of reality that I experience. Because reason is wonderful, but how do I use reason when I'm talking about love? And how many books should I write in order to be able to express the nature of love to someone? You know, ten books? Is it a hundred books? How many of you? Is it not true that the greatest gloss of a symphony is another symphony? And that the greatest gloss of a poem is another poem? We can't really get around that. And so we end up finding on the other side almost the mirror image of fundamentalism, what I like to call uh, an anti-religious orthodoxy. And where we find these, these, we stake our heels in the ground in order to be able to make sure that we don't lose what it is that holds me secure. And, 
and, and I, after, certainly after hearing the presentations today, um, I could very well say that if Cromwell was not open to the subtleties and to the questions and the possibilities, uh, I may not have a job. Uh, the, the, the Jewish people might not have been here. And those are our greatest hours. Those are our greatest expressions. And so um, it's, an important, it's important to be able to bring that into the dialogue and recognize that it's, that it's there. And, and, and how is it that we're going to, to address those issues? Thank you. Um, just a couple of comments. One on, on this word tolerance again. And I think I want to make it clear on behalf of all those who have discussed it that nobody is against what tolerance positively represents. The word itself has a color which has some difficulties in that it assumes one person is doing something to another, which is rather short of respect or attention or even love. And I want to move us away from the rather negative connotations of tolerance to something a little bit more positive as we look at each other. But let me say about two other things. Um, one is a point from both sides of the room about relativism, about truth claims, and so forth. It seems to me that a secular administration, as as I try to um, love it, represents a kind of pragmatic suspension of religious concussions in the public arena. We need, for certain purposes, to bracket the convictions of different communities in order that those communities are set free to be themselves, to engage with one another constructively. I, I sometimes call that procedural secularism, a deliberate suspension. And that, I think, is what um, distinguishes it from the secularist agenda, what I would pass for programmatic secularism, which seeks deliberately to exclude from public discussion all elements of the transcendent. And I quite agree with them that we are up against aspects of our political and administrative culture which blur those in very, very dangerous ways. Um, I've quoted it many times in the last couple of months, and I quoted again without apology, something said to me by um, a friend of mine who's a university chaplain in another university. Um, the instruction given to her and her chaplain's team by the HR department of the university was that they must on no account express any opinion to an undergraduate. <laughs> <laughs> now that's the kind of thing that we, we ought to be really, really anxious about. And that's why I don't think it's immediately an option for relatives. <coughs> the context in which we are culturally and politically encouraged to express our truth claims and discuss them and argue about them is, I think, a healthy environment. As a matter of fact, I disagree religiously with quite a lot of people in this room. Um, and that's fine. In other words, I believe that some things are true which they don't, and vice versa. That's fine. We ought to be able to talk about that with a sense that it's truth we're talking about, not just taste or hobbies or whatever. So I don't think that we are stuck with um, sort of totally relativist philosophy if we look for what I call the pragmatic. Now, not everyone agrees, but that's, that's what I mean by the mind. And that's not to say, echoing Virginia, that relativism isn't an intellectual problem or a cultural problem. The awkward fact is, of course, no government is really relativist. All administrations will further aims which they believe to be true and right. Um, the problem, I think, is cultural. It's an indifferentism. Um, a lack of intellectual rigor which afflicts us, and the reduction of thinking to feeling. Academics will be very used to marking essays in which um, people write things like Kant felt 
that imperative <laughs> was a good idea. And whenever I see that in SSI, I always want to cross up with felt. So no, he didn't feel it, he thought it. The thinking actually matters. The last point is a um, point from the back of our defense and Mary's comment as well. I think this again is a worrying feature of our environment because it reflects the notion that ideally everyone's convictions should be in protected silence. And that assumes that the human intellect, especially the, the young student, student human intellect, is such a fragile plant that, back to my uh, friend in chaplaincy, no specific idea can be allowed to violate it. And that's, that's worrying. Offence is real, and offence is something which is difficult to handle, humanly and institutionally. But I think we need the cultural environment, not so much legal, but cultural environment, in which we understand the imperative of respect, positively speaking, in which we understand the peculiarly obnoxious nature of offence when it's given by the powerful to the less powerful, where we understand that we are moving into a world where our opinions and convictions are not immune from not only disagreement but mockery, and where we have enough confidence in ourselves and in our cultural ambience not to feel that any disturbing element is, is destructive and traumatic. And that is a real cultural challenge, because we are now encouraging more and more people to feel fragile. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that, that can be good for us. Mm -hmm. I'd like to pick up on three points. Uh, first of all, John, the truth claim, something I've also thought as you know quite a lot about in the Jewish Christian encounter. Um, and I, I, I like the term particularity of faith. The particularity of faith in that the world has changed in the Christ event. And I have mine in the experience in the Revelation of Sinai. They, they are particularities of faith. So what do we do with them? It, it, it does seem to me that in the Jewish Christian account, for example, this is something that St. Paul really grappled with. And, and, and in Romans 9 to 11, as you know, he really grapples with the fact that there is this uh, promise that God made with Israel. And God doesn't break his promises. What kind of God is that that breaks promises? And yet everything's changed. And, and, and what he does, and this is where I think there's some lesson for us today, is he throws up his arms in the end. Or like throws up everything. He looks up and says, how inscrutable are your ways, O Lord? In other words, it, God will sort it out at the end time. Those truth claims. The but is, what about the meantime? And well, that's where we are living, in the meantime. And it's working out those rules and those practices and those customs that we can live together in the meantime without abandoning our truth claims, whether they are of a secular uh, nature or whether they're of a religious nature. And I think there's some, for me personally, uh, that's how I have to try and hold those, those two things together. I think that just takes a case to be specific on that. My life had been enormously changed by sort of like throwaway line in the Times a few years ago when Ruth Kelly was wrestling with the problems of being in a Labour government and um, was having to deal with the question of abortion agencies. Sorry, that's very, very part of the adoption agency, very, very part of And the Times columnist said that when Clem Attlee sent his son to, to an independent school, Clem Attlee said, the man who lives um, the man who lives in the world as though the world he's living in is the world he seeks to create is a fool. And I, that tension between, as people of faith, imagining ourselves in the world we seek to create and actually being the mess of the world it is, that tension is now central to my life. I mean, it's really helped me to understand um, what, what the problem is. I think it, it goes straight to the heart of what you just said, but it's a really good motto the man, uh, of course it's gendered in the 1940s, but the person who lives in the world as though the world he is living in is the world he seeks to create is a fool. And one way actually the way of the martyr, 
and the other is the way of a person who does accommodate, who does acculturate, who does I think, that's try to hold, so he tries to move the world on slightly by journeying with the world. And that ability of to take people with you without, as it were, denying the value of, of, the, of, of what they have to offer. That's a really crucial distinction for me. And I'm not a martyr. I am someone who wants to travel in the world as it is, but seek to ameliorate it. And I think, to, uh, for me, it's been a very important motto. It's in, that, in, in the between. Yes. Um, Madeline, your specific question um, about the um, identities um, and the, the, the challenge of the multiplicity of identity. If I can share what, uh, a, a story with you about a Jew from Warsaw who went to New York in the late 19th century. And he came back and told his friends what, he, what happened to him. He said, it was amazing. I met this Jew went to New York. I, I met a, a Jew who was a capitalist. I met a Jew who was a communist. And I met a Jew who was ultra-Orthodox. And I met a Jew who was reform. I met a Jew who was secular. And his friends said, well, what's so strange? There are lots of Jews in New York. He said, you don't understand. It was the same Jew. <laughs> <laughs> this whole point about the struggle of who we are is at the core of the work of the Wolf Institute. And it's not something that I deny in any way. In fact, that is the reality of the situation, but it's a struggle. It's not an easy place to sit. And one of the challenges we have, if we feel under attack, under siege, with particularly the Muslim communities in this country feel, there is a sense of retreating within the one label, which is often the religious ethno label. And that's very dangerous. So, yes, it is a struggle. I think it is a struggle holding those different identities together, but actually that's the only place that we can sit. And the, the, I'd like to offer a slightly different view, um, Miri, um, at this question about um, safe space. Because I've also spent a long time thinking about this, and in, 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 in my work, it, it should be an uncomfortable, we, we, uncomfortable place. We have to ask difficult questions in the encounter between different faiths in society. And, and yet, this is a genuine, it's not, this is a, there's a genuine generational shift going on, it seems to me. And our generation, as parents, you know, maybe as grandparents, have to take seriously that a younger generation is challenge, challenging us on this point. They're not challenging us just to avoid the conversation, they're challenging us, and I think we have to think about that quite carefully. I had this very debate with my son. Um, who was trying to explain to me why he thought the Rhodes question was a real question. And it, 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 it really challenged me. So I think there's a generational shift going on that we as educators as well as parents need to grapple with. That there is a desire amongst the younger generation to challenge our method of learning, the method of teaching, the whole pedagogy. And I think we have to take that seriously. Like Right, and I'm also worried about the fragility of that generation. That's a genuine worry, but I don't think there is a danger that we just dismiss it. And, and I think we have to really think through what is going on there, probably on an ad hoc basis, rather than trying to generalise this as a major. But there is, there is something that I think we need to think through that is more than just the stupidity of the next generation. There, there's something happening there that we need to take seriously as teachers. Can I just come back there? Because I think it's very interesting. It's definitely um, not the stupidity at all. Because as I say, like, like you, with me it was in country, my, my next generation. But, um, and, and also, what worried me also was that we're in the danger of dismissing a whole area of post-colonial sentiment, which is absolute, or in the case of the case of in Yale, of course the burden of, you know, African-American, uh, um, the burden of all sort of cruelty and abuse that they've suffered and still do. But yes, but the question was how to actually use those materials in a way that opens up conversation and brings us together rather than shutting down in the silo that you described. No, I absolutely agree. It's not about dismissing. It's about worrying that what comes out of it is this sort of sanitized version and, and actually stops the conversations that we need to have. And it's also a product of the global institutes. You know, you have a Rhodes student, a Rhodes scholar from South Africa, bringing his politics 
to the front of Oriel College, and that's also the world that we have to get used to because politics are global, visible, etc. So no, I do absolutely take your point, but I also think that we don't that um, it is a struggle, as you said. But there's also some stuff that you, you also want to challenge them back, I think. But it's also an argument, if we, if we just say, it's also an argument about, um, about where politics uh, uh, comes from. It, it goes back to the uh, a point which was made before about the distinction between feeling and thinking. Um, and, and in a sense, this is one extension of um, of identity politics, which is to say that because I feel in some way unsettled, that that's a political position. Now that's actually quite a novel um, stance to, uh, uh, to, uh, to take, and um, I, I agree that if people are taking it, it needs to be taken seriously because it's actually indicative of a much wider style of politics, but I, I don't think we should feel inhibited about challenging it. No, I, I hope we don't feel inhibited. I, I entirely take Ed's point, and I, I don't want to be heard as saying that everybody just ought to man up. Because <laughs> 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 that, that's not it. Offence is real, and I think it's right that we be reminded that so many kinds of discourse are profoundly offensive. I'm a parent of children with the same sort of ages as well as Ed. I, and you ask me, I hear this from them, and I'm grateful to be prodded on this, as I'm by the undergraduates of our college. But I was weak, I was saying. It's just that we have quite properly and irreversibly woken up to the damage we have unthinkingly done in the ways we've talked and imaged our world. Take that absolutely for granted. And precisely because that's been such a major shift and such an important new move in our cultural life, it becomes, I think, rather dangerously easy to say, well, this is now how leverage and power work. It's by the claim of facts. I'm not sure that's a very good place to be. Um, and how to negotiate that without politically the reality of offence, oppression, genuine violence, verbal violence, imaginative visual violence. How should that without you know, dismissing the seriousness? Yes, it's a very difficult moment. For so now there are a number of points I want to make, but probably we'll be running out of time for a little more. Let me start from this one. Is relativism necessary to toleration? No. Toleration of foolish behavior, will always be with us. Parents come across teenage behavior, which is unquestionably foolish in some cases. But the kind of toleration which parents exercise is about distinguishing between the behavior and the person. We disapprove of the or behavior, we don't disapprove of the person. The person is still very valuable, important as such. The behavior, is, the behavior may be altogether self-destructive or just wrong-headed or whatever it is. Tolerance is about disagreeing without disapproving. Tolerance is about difference with conviction. Accepting difference without losing your own convictions. That is what tolerance is about. Now, we may be perhaps playing with words and disagreeing about the interpretation of words, particularly Rowan, uh, Williams, and I, but it seems to me it's an essential dimension of any uh, society. I was going to say a liberal society, any society, starting from the family. You need tolerance. Disagreeing is natural, it's human you must be able to realize that apart from the issue in which you disagree with your partner, your children, your colleagues, whatever it is, there is the intrinsic value of these people. Uh, in, in many other spheres, in spheres in which they may be right and you may be wrong. Now, David Feldman has raised a very important question because there are areas, uh, when you were talking, for example, of circumcision and we were talking of various other things. Um, there are areas in which 
uh, and religious opinions, religious traditions may overstep the, the, the difference which John Stuart Mill himself, very much the product of, of the Puritan tradition we're talking about, John Stuart Mill described as a self-regarding, the other regarding actions. And it's a big philosophical question of what is self-regarding, what is other regarding. And I suppose it is certainly beyond how, sorry, my ability anyway, perhaps our time this evening to come down with, that, with an answer. But whatever the answer is, you must train yourselves and the rest of society to put up with offense, without taking offense. There are so many forms of behavior, endless forms of behavior, which are, in one way or other, offensive to some of us. And some of, some of these offenses about taste, bad taste is offensive, bad manners are offensive. Should we imprison everybody who is not, is not properly mannered? I suppose we don't have enough space to imprison um, you know, all the people who, who need to be dealt with in this way. So we need to be able to create an environment in which people put up with offense. And this is not for the sake of religious people. So I disagree with David Feldman when he said John Morley and I have a sort of frustration with um, you know, the growth of relativism and so on and so forth. I don't know about John, but from my point of view as a Protestant dissenter, relativism is just the old beast, but the steward desperate. Um, and, and my answer is just the old answer. Here I stand, I can't do otherwise, so let me go. But the problem is, and when this relativist becomes inspired policy makers, then it leads us into disasters like the handling of the Middle East, the various Middle Eastern crises, the invasion of Iraq, the invasions of Iraq, and various other similar policies which are based on assumptions which may be true in Washington, in London, simply don't work in a different world. The first step to handle reality, not just the Middle East, or not just fundamentalism, <coughs> whatever it is, the first step about hunting reality is understanding it. And that is where the historical method uh, uh, comes in, which involves, among other things, putting up with endless, endless offensive things. You study Nazism. It's just unspeakable. But if you study, indeed, many of the things we were told, we were told by some of the speakers, by Miri and David Abulat in particular, uh, were unspeakable and unacceptable. Should we then turn and ignore them? No, no, part of the, part of the usefulness of, his, of history and historical methods is precisely training society and training individuals who are not historians in particular, policy makers more than anybody else, and training them into accepting the unacceptable. That is where tolerance is still necessary. And um, it is essential that we distinguish uh, between tolerance and between, no, between, between offense and between what really causes bodily harm in particular or which destroys property or in other ways interferes with material, with material uh, life. And that may be the bottom line in defining when intolerance should not be accepted. And I take for granted, I, I accept the Feldman, Feldman's case the distinction between self-regarding and other-regarding choices is very difficult to do. It is nevertheless an essential distinction. The bottom line, going back to what Simone Magenzani was saying, is the uh, separation of powers between, between uh, religious and between convictions in general, not just religious convictions, convictions in general, and, and, and political power. The ability to, to, to define a sphere within which uh, opinions, however of, must be respected. And of course, there are all sorts of line, difficult lines to draw, but for as long as opinions don't have the power to in, inflict suffering or to deprive people from the enjoyment of life, these opinions should be respected. I suppose from a religious point of view, I suppose here, Jews and Christians agree. The starting point in any discourse about toleration is that our God is tolerant. Our God is put up with this world for, well, 
considerable time, and most of us in this position will have destroyed it within 20 minutes. Certainly, I would. Um, because, because of this unspeakable nature of, uh, you know, of, of what is wrong. But because we come from, from, from this starting point, a, religious, a religion based on a, on, a, on a tolerant road, we don't have any right not to be tolerant. <coughs> I was very struck um, by the talk at the beginning of the day about Cromwell for, um, for, for many reasons, um, not just because I'm a person who can trace her family back to one of the Jewish families of Cromwell at that time, and not just because it was dedicated to my father's memory, but it was the first time I ever saw the issue from Cromwell's perspective. And I, I thought, what an interesting man Cromwell must have been. And he was decisive. He was, um, he was leading change. And he talked about his process of trying to create consensus and new ways of governance. I'd be really intrigued, really, if Cromwell was sitting on that panel, or he was in charge then. Um, not really debating what does tolerance mean or what does tolerance not mean. How would Cromwell have tried to take in this problem, which is a problem of our time, and try to manage a process to come to some sort of action? We have taken for granted monarchy, House of Lords, established religion, and the concept of the Confederate State was torn down in the 1640s. He thought that had to be God's doing. Because the amount of suffering when people died it had to be for a greater cause than simply <coughs> stitching up some new thing. So he, he he thinks that all forms will be destroyed so that God, in the end, can create new forms. And he thought that the truth uh, had been shattered. And many people could testify to a greater truth than any truth that had been uh, uh, taken previously. So he was trying to build a mosaic of truth from fragments that were scattered across. Now, he would say, um, um, uh, amongst those Christians who accept two basic principles. One was that, that that truth was contained in scripture. So in order to have something to contribute, you had to accept that truth was to be found in scripture. He didn't prescribe what that truth would be. But you had to sign up to that. Now the second and more, and the thing which is you know, less satisfactory from today's point of view is he would insist on Trinitarianism. Let's say the four ecumenical councils of the early church had wrestled with the, with the fundamental issues and we could trust that the Holy Spirit had guided them to a truth which needed to be part of a new truth. Now what I'm, here, what I'm thinking about, the radical thing that's happened to me in, um, in um, preparing this lecture, it's particularly that deliberate statement that he makes in 1648 uh, that, um, that there must be an understanding reached between, and then he gives that list, which includes Jews and Gentiles. You, you also talked about a committee that he set up. And that yes. committee was open to peace of people with very um, extreme... Yes, I mean, voice. How would you, what, his, exper he his experience as a soldier, his experience as a soldier had been that when you had apparently insoluble problems, you sat down as a, as, a, as a representative of the army and you prayed. And the form of prayer was you sat almost Quaker-like in silence until a scripture came to you you thought uh, was pertinent. And then you expanded it. And sometimes it was seed which fell on stony ground. And sometimes the whole group seized it and worked with it. And the most controversial, but most, most easily established, is when from the book of Judges, um, a, a common soldier said that God would, have, uh, God, God would have judgment on a man of blood, that those who shed innocent blood must, must suffer, and that God used human agency to, um, to deal with a man of blood. And, and now the time had come when they had the moral authority to take Charles I on trial because they had been given a mandate by God to be his agents in destroying a man of blood. And the whole assembly signed up to it. Now, I, I, because he had that experience a number of times, I think what happens in December 1656, he hopes the same thing will happen again. He hoped by getting 28 lawyers, merchants, and ministers across the spectrum together, 
that they will deliberate under the spirit and that they will find consensus. And not for the first time in his life, he's very disappointed. They don't. They, stay, they, they, they dig into trenches. And so then he has a choice of either saying it's not meant to be or, well, the God is throwing it back into my hands. I have to make, I have to make judgments, even though I prefer it to be something that's come. So I think that gives you an approximate view. Um, and I, see that I think for the present, that's about as far as I probably ought to Thank go. Thank you, John. <laughs> Can we move on? Mm -hmm. I'm just very interested in that conversion thing. Because I think that's something that is very important. And I think that you have to subject to get it, not only because of the massive methodological issues, you know, people's security, negative rules, etc. But also, people are very, very emotional about mm -hmm. conversion. And that is really what, for obvious reasons. And it just occurred to me that in the context of some of the things that have been said, for example, uh, the toleration of difference, the issue of here I stand, and, you know, the issue of, um, um, Truth claims. The issue also of the young, very interesting research about adolescence and conversion, which actually is very, very relevant to, to the whole issue of sort of recruitment to things like ISIS and so on. Um, I was just um, wondering if, because we brought it up this really interesting discussion, whether you could say something, all of you perhaps, or some of you perhaps, about how particularly the presence of converts, of course, we have heard about the Lafayette a lot, about the possibilities that are open up to converts, but also the difficulties. <coughs> so, um, if you could say something particularly about conversion and how it presses, perhaps, upon some of the issues of toleration that we've been talking about. Well, I, I'll just add something on the end of your question, because it, 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 it came to my mind I mean, John Coffey's talk, where um, I, I, it seemed to me that um, the, uh, there's perhaps a greater tension between evangelical conversionism and toleration that then um, quite came out in the talk. Um, that um, it's at the was the case that evangelicals venerated Jews, but they also looked forward to a world in which there would be no more Jews. And um, obviously that has a ring to it um, now, which 17th, 18th, 19th century evangelicals uh, I could not imagine. But all the same, um, it's not that uh, there is a tension between toleration and conversion. I mean, just to follow up on that, I think one key thing is if you have the power differentials, which yes. in a sense the speaker earlier was talking about, so if a very powerful group is trying to convert a very vulnerable minority, that seems to me a different matter than if it's the other way yeah. around. Yeah. Right? Um, I do think that the freedom to convert has got to be essential in a liberal mm -hmm. democracy. It, it, it seems to me it's one of the big issues with Islam, the law of apostasy, and the fact that you do not have the freedom to convert. So in that sense, conversion seems to me to be absolutely essential to a kind of a free pluralistic society. I think converts often have a very interesting role because in a sense, it's difficult to move entirely from one side to the other. So it, often they find themselves in the middle. Um, and recently I've been reading John Connolly's book on um, From Enemy to Brother, which is about what he sees as a revolution in, attitudes in the Catholic Church to the Jews. All of his protagonists, all of the people who are shifting Catholic attitudes towards the Jews in what he sees as a more positive uh, way are converts. Yeah, every single one of them. So, uh, and they perform in a sense almost this mediatorial role because they haven't actually moved in a sense entirely over. They, they're, they're Jewish, but still remains very important to them. So I, I think it, it is this very sensitive complicated question, but it is very, it's very important. And, and indeed, there's a long tradition there, I mean, in a sense, against what I said before, uh, Jewish converts to, uh, to Christianity were some of the foremost defenders of Jews against anti-Semitism, against blood libel, and so forth. So yes, absolutely.
Yes, um, so I was just wondering to what extent um, any of you would tolerate a non scientific or being because in the future we're facing threats from global warming and things. And to what extent would you tolerate someone who has a non scientific view? Thank you. Nice, 
in our tolerance. But if there is not ultimate viability in our tolerance, meaning that it allows for lives to be able to develop, for the world to be able to develop, then we are lacking something central to it. And so in a, in a question of whether scientific uh, understandings of the world or definitions of the world are to be brought in, of course they can be brought in. To disregard them completely would mean that we aren't sensitive to certain realities that are, that are there at present. And the question, on that, perhaps, is what's the tipping point? To, to what degree can we absorb these, these tolerant um, understandings and at the same time be able to maintain a productive and developing future for humanity and the world? And that's, that's a painful, <coughs> perhaps people might take offense you know, to, these, to these questions, but, but viability needs to be at the core of a conversation. And, and uh, you know, Einstein said, uh, a man, and I'm sure he included women in this as well, that should not should should look for what is and not for what he wishes. To be. And uh, I think the point was that there is a level of objective reality there. That um, that perhaps in a society here where where very much we're used to thinking in terms of relativistic visions, there has to be some level of question where where does the viability come in and what do we do? Could I think go on talking about the definition of tolerance? Or yes. Um, I, I think all I wanted to do was put a very large question mark on the other side of the world because of some of its history. Reciprocal tolerance is fine, though it's still not something a bit more engaged. Somehow. Tolerance sounds slightly passive, but I will pursue that. Um, three quick remarks. Conversion. The point's been made, I think, that it's very difficult indeed to think through the issues of conversion without the power question being present. I'd like to think that in a genuinely pluralist society, we could talk more candidly and freely about conversion than sometimes we can at the moment, where there are historic and cultural pressures of all sorts. It's, it's a vastly complicated area, but I, I would agree that religious freedom must entail yeah. freedom of conversion. It's a major issue with the Muslim world and very hard to break through at that particular point. Tolerating non-scientific worldviews. Um, I don't think we've got much choice. There are people around who've got them. <laughs> on scientific <laughs> worldviews. Um, and it's a major problem at a time when I think the both the rational and the faithful response to our global ecological crisis requires us to take certain public steps. Um, it's a problem, but it means we have to argue. By tolerating, I don't resign the right to argue with those who have non-scientific worldviews, nor do I think that any governmental authority should step back from um, taking decisive action, because a significant minority of people have non-scientific worldviews. So tolerance, fine, but also argument and public decision. Um, and finally, on um, yeah, the critical engagement with other environments, other religious traditions. To me, the key word is trust. You begin to make yourself a credible participant in somebody else's discussion by a long process of building trust, building relation. It's not much use of walking literally or metaphorically to somebody else's territory and saying we have the answers to your problems. But we are in a world where the challenges are so great, see previous remarks, <laughs> um, that we can't simply ignore other communities. We need to build alliances, for a sustainable future, alliances for peace. We need to find ways of working alongside people and identifying with them what is not tolerable because it's destructive of our human, our human community. So we build trust in others and very, 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 very simply that's earned the right to ask some awkward questions. And we we do seek to involve ourselves in the issues, the political issues of other parts of the world in the way in which naturally a major constructive difference, which is not something we've learned so far. <coughs> Three very brief points. 
First, I think we abandon toleration at our peril. It's, it's very easy to give up on the term toleration. If we are going to abandon it, we have to replace it with something that's better. So with all the caveats that have been said about the passivity of toleration, um, nevertheless, it has enabled us to create a society. Uh, and I, 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 I'm very reluctant to give up on it. But if we were to move forward from it, then what is it? Well, the term pluralism, I think, requires some kind of affirmation of others in our society. And that's the difference, perhaps, between mid-17th century Britain and Britain today, where you, you had such a dominant society that could enable another to exist and return pragmatically and open a cemetery and open a synagogue. That is not enough today. What is required today is affirmation of those others. And the third point is we have to take seriously the context. The context in Doha, for example, is a very different context than we have in Cambridge. In Doha and in other places in the Middle East, it's a very unsettled place. And that feeling of being unsettled is partly social economic. Oil is now a third in terms of value, so therefore they are not quite as wealthy as they thought they were. That's not a pleasant feeling for anybody, however rich you are. And secondly, the region itself is going up in flames. It's a very uncomfortable place to be in. So if we're going to engage in a conversation, in an encounter, in a, a pursuit of tolerance in that part of the world, we have to take those, that, that context very, very seriously. And that can be achieved, as Roy said, to begin with by building up trust and building up respect. And then we can ask difficult questions. And that's the context of one particular place. We multiply that much further um, and much greater in other places. Which, which, and I'd like to end with the, one of my favorite rabbinic phrases, um, which is, Asei l'cha chaber, get yourself a friend, get yourself a partner. And it's that friendship and that, that partnership and that hebruta that allows the disagreement, that allows the toleration, that allows, hopefully, the affirm affirmation. But it's got to be done on a contextual basis. Thank you. Well, first of all, I totally agree with what has been said by the other members of this round table, and particularly with the point which Ed has just made about context. Attention to context is essential requirement of historical analysis. And I think that is one of the many ways in which historical analysis provides guidance for life. Answering to, uh, trying to address the question of conversion, which we have uh, raised, I was really, like everybody else, stressed the importance of context and power. Um, speaking as a historian, of course, there is, there is not just one category of conversion which operates across history. It is essential, for example, to see which between situations that John Coffey was saying, within which some people in a position of power, even absolute power, try to force minorities to convert, and other situations in which people change their minds because that is part of a pluralist society. And one of the many you know, assumptions or jokes about American society is the same family you can have five or, six, five or six different confessions because people are converted, change their mind. And indeed, changing one's mind is an essential requirement of life, not necessarily in the religious sphere, but in many other spheres, is essential if you want to survive. As for the evangelicals, it is very interesting. In a, in a way, they are the quintessential modern representatives of what conversion should be about, because they do not perceive the world as consisting of two groups, the, con the evangelicals and the non-evangelicals. Each generation, each individual, has to be converted, irrespective of the background. So conversion becomes an existential choice which each individual has to make for himself or herself. There is no, there is no motorway into salvation which avoids the issue of conversion. And that again is interesting because I think it is so symptomatic or symbolic, uh, I think, of what conversion should be in a free society. A personal choice 
and a, a serious one in many cases, in all cases perhaps, in which other people's lives are concerned. The question about non-scientific views. It seems to me the essential requirement here is to distinguish and divide power from belief. Religion from the ability to enforce belief. And this applies also to the toleration of any use when it comes to beliefs. Of course, there are all sorts of other considerations which are of a pragmatic nature. Cromwell, again, sets a very good example for. There are questions of means and ends. And they are not about toleration. For example, the you know, global world, we may have to take decisions which have nothing to do with tolerating individual religious views, but simply are imposed by, by, by flooding, for example, or by you know, drought, or whatever it is. So these are decisions which pertain to pragmatic choices. If you want to secure some material ends, some results, you have to take some steps towards them, whether or not your convictions are consistent with policy or not. Um, so I, I suppose these are the only two points I want to make, and in any case, we have already uh, run out of time. The last thing I'm going to say is a totally different and uh, practical uh, two things I want to say. First of all, thank uh, the audience and the, the members of this panel for what I think uh, will have just been a very, very interesting conference. And the second thing, uh, drinks are provided in the entrance hall here for all of us to enjoy and to continue our conversation and have a formal way of Thank you.